I think it's time to start. We will have more colleagues, no doubt, uh, coming in as we go along, but uh, we have a very full agenda and we want to make sure that we have time for discussion. So um, without any other delay, I would like to welcome you all to our panel. My name is Professor Joanne Guri. I'm the Academic Director for Education and Internationalization at the University of Warwick. Uh, and I also have the privilege uh, of working on EUtopia's learning model and curriculum development uh, alongside a team of esteemed colleagues uh, who lead development uh, under the uh, Utopia's education working package. Uh, Jan Dankert, Meta Sandorf, Linda Morio, and Rosette Sayers are with us, and I'm going to introduce them as they take the floor later. And we also have the pleasure and absolute privilege to be joined uh, by three leading colleagues who are with us today. Uh, Dirk van Damme, Mark Brown, uh, Lieve van den Brande, thank you very much for accepting our invitation uh, and for agreeing to share uh, your expertise and thoughts with us today. Uh, what we want to do in the next uh, sort of 90 minutes or so uh, is to uh, very much have uh, as much time for interaction uh, to bring together uh, the work of the uh, Utopian uh, education model development uh, and the work that is actually currently taking place under uh, the European education area. This is the main focus of our panel. So as we all know, the European education area uh, is sets out a vision uh, and an agenda. And what's very important is that this agenda involves an open, fluid and transnational European education. Uh, there are three main objectives to be implemented by 2025 uh, in line uh, with this framework, promoting cross-border learning, mobility and cooperation, removing obstacles to the free movement of learning and inclusive uh, and innovative lifelong learning. The combined policy framework of the European education area and the digital education action plan provide an opportunity and momentum to build on the legacy of Bologna and Erasmus plus and design the European university of the future, moving beyond the challenges of harmonization and implementation that we've experienced in the past and provide the much needed support for pedagogic innovation and parity of esteem between research and education. Utopia provides an opportunity for curricular development, inter-institutional cooperation and flexible blended mobility. Today, we're particularly interested in focusing on the potential of the utopian model for lifelong learning, and particularly on the synergies between the renewed attention to micro-credentials and the utopia learning model. Moving from a model introduced at the time of the growth of the knowledge economy, micro-credentialing appears to be integral to the European University of the Future, advocating strong relationships between academia, industry, and virtual mobility development. In this context, a range of issues are open to debate, including the role of universities, what is the role of universities and of other providers, would we have to choose between micro-credentialing and traditional degrees, what is the business model uh, for diversifying the pedagogic offering of the modern European universities, and what are possible policy obstacles in achieving that. I'm delighted to discuss this with the distinguished panel of experts from across Europe who are at the forefront of education policy and the design and implementation of pedagogic innovation. Our panel today is organized in two parts. I will first invite uh, Dirk van Damme, Mark Brown and Lieve van den Brande to provide uh, their views on micro-credentialing, lifelong learning and the role of universities. And then turn to my utopian colleagues and ask them a series of questions uh, in relation to the Utopia model and its application before opening the floor to questions uh, from the audience and the panel itself. Uh, please, we want to uh, have this as an interactive session. This is why we didn't go for the webinar format and we an attempt to have as many boxes uh, on the screen as possible. Please use the chat and we will try and monitor the chat and take questions at the appropriate time. 
Uh, and of course, you're also very welcome to turn your camera on and take the floor when, when uh, you want to ask your question uh, later on. Uh, so uh, without any other delay, uh, Derek Van Damme, you're a senior counselor in the Directorate for Education and Skills at the OECD in Paris and head of the Center for Educational Research and Innovation. What is the role of universities in the current fast changing landscape in your view? Thank you, Joe, and uh, a good afternoon to all of you. Um, I'm very happy to join this panel. I think it's a very interesting and uh, relevant topic to, to discuss. Um, for my initial statement, I have uh, prepared five points I want to make very briefly. Um, I may be a little bit controversial in, in the way that I address them because I really want to provoke the discussion. And I think it's better to, to have very clear, even provocative statements. Um, first of all, the, the topic of lifelong learning um, it's a fascinating topic, but uh, I must be honest, I'm quite uh, disillusioned about lifelong learning. It's with us as a concept for over 60, 70 years. Um, you don't find any ministerial speech for the last 20, 30 years without the lifelong learning word in it. Um, I have been uh, working in research on lifelong learning, I think 30, 40 years ago very little has changed um, over all the ideas and proposals and suggestions that have been made over this um, almost half a century very little has been materialized and that's uh, that's a bit yeah disillusioning um, to, to consider um, it might very well be that the pandemic is going to to provoke some changes in this. Uh, the pandemic will have uh, an enorm enormous impact on labor markets. It will lead to a reallocation of labor um, and to a massive effort uh, of reskilling, upskilling of uh, of workers. Um, many economists are pointing to this already. So that might provoke uh, a very strong reaction from governments in the years to come to support the lifelong learning from a reskilling uh, perspective. Um, the second point is uh, the role of universities in lifelong learning. Um, we must be very honest and humble. Universities have not played a major role in lifelong learning so far. Um, they have paid tribute to it, like everyone, um, but they have taken very little action. Uh, I don't know of any university who really has profoundly rethought its own mission in a lifelong learning perspective. Um, that's, that's maybe a little bit too strong, but that's um, my, my convic conviction. It's, there is not a very good track record of universities. I'm not speaking about the open universities, which of course have a dedicated mission and role in this landscape and who, um, who have uh, played a, a very interesting role, but who still are seen as a kind of peripheral uh, part of the, of the academic landscape. Um, even in the UK, where the Open University has such an important uh, and very, yeah, impressive role. Um, the numbers, uh, if, if you just look at the numbers of non-traditional students, uh, the age cohorts um, above, let's say, the years uh, 30, um, the numbers are still marginal. It's a little bit better in the United States, um, but in Europe, the numbers of uh, students which are older than, than 30 are, are, yeah, single digit figures uh, in most universities, which is um, not a good sign. Um, of course, lifelong learning is not only institutionalized formal education. That's often a mistake that has been made. The impact of institutions on the learning behavior of individuals is actually quite marginal. Um, and that's something that we probably didn't realize many years ago when we started to think about lifelong learning. We thought that the major in, uh, educational institutions would still play the, the role of providing the, the, the educational um, offerings that would be used by people. Um, I think we really have to understand that lifelong learning is about the agency of learners to take into their own hands um, a learning initiative and to do it by all possible 
means and certainly not only the uh, institutional uh, offerings. So the delivery modes um, are very becoming very complex and use learners uh, use whatever they they find interesting to meet their own um, purposes. Um, my third point is exactly on diversifying delivery mode, but from from a university perspective, um, I think we don't have to make any illusions. If you take lifelong learning seriously as a university, um, you have to change your delivery modes. You have to provide the multiple delivery modes of the same content, um, very flexible. Um, and this requires an enormous amount of investment. And those universities who think that lifelong learning is something that they have to do, I see a complete underestimation of the um, investments to redesign the teaching and learning environment. Um, and that's uh, a very challenging point because as most open universities will tell you, um, there is a huge investment to be made in the beginning, which may be pay off uh, after many years because of the scaling effect. But in the beginning, um, investing in lifelong learning is uh, a huge effort and an effort that most of our universities are not able to do. Um, not financially, but more importantly, not in terms of expertise. They don't have the expertise to redesign the learning environment in ways that meet the expectations of adult learners um, in, in the current uh, uh, societies. Um, of course, digital environments are becoming very important. Um, I think this is um, not necessarily related to lifelong learning. I think the digital context, as we see now uh, during the pandemic, is, is just invading the traditional teaching and learning environment. Um, the digital uh, context is not yet transforming profoundly the teaching and learning environment. Uh, I don't see that happening. Uh, what I see is a very mediocre ways of providing digital learning. Um, videotaping a lecture is not a digital teaching and learning environment. Um, and many universities are now making the same mistakes that the MOOCs have made in the years 2012, 13, 14 in the United States, when they very used very simple ways of transmitting content. Uh, most of the, let's say, the contemporary MOOC providers are doing good work. I think especially Future Learn in the UK is really, for me, the best example. But traditional universities are not yet up to that kind of reshaping, redesigning the learning uh, environment. My fourth point is on, and I'm coming to micro-credentials then, my fourth point is on qualifications. Um, I think we are now in a context where qualifications are losing their power as being the main currency of university education. Um, we see that in many, many areas, and there is not yet a real, really good conversation on this. Um, but it's, it's a very important sign when big transnational companies, um, consultancy firms, uh, the Apples and the Googles, uh, Microsoft, uh, they all publicly announce that when they recruit candidates for their jobs, they don't no longer look at degrees. Degrees don't have any currency value anymore for most global companies. And you have to realize that. Um, and, and why is that? Because they say, well, we don't know whether a degree still is an equivalent for the skills that we think are important for the workers that we need. Um, so there is a discrepancy between qualifications and skills. Uh, and that has to do, that's a long topic um, and, and a topic that uh, I love to talk about for, for hours, if you, if you want me. Um, the problem is with assessment. Um, the let's say the employers, when they speak to us in, in the OECD, for example, they say we no longer trust the assessment that universities make of students. We, we see that students which are well assessed in universities do not have the skills we 
think are important. And it's not only about the skills mismatch, it's also about the assessment procedures itself. So what do employers do? They do the assessments again. And you see a shift from university assessments to assessments within industry or within employers or organizations at large. And that's invalidating the critical function of universities in the area of assessment. Um, and that in turn leads to um, a dequalification of qualifications. So qualifications are losing their trading value on the labor market. And that's a process which is really taking uh, strength uh, today, not in the national context, but because in the national context, qualifications are protected. But in the international context, and if, you, if your ambition is to become transnational, qualifications are losing uh, their power. And then my final point, five on micro-credentials, because my, I see micro-credentials as an attempt to solve this conundrum, um, to make the gap between qualifications and skills uh, more visible, um, to uh, provide employers with more easy to understand kinds of bits and pieces of qualifications. Um, I must say, I have a bit of an ambivalent uh, attitude. I think it's a very interesting phenomenon, and we study it at the OECD. Uh, we just published an, an interesting working paper on this, if you are interested. Um, but I, I do not believe that micro-credentials will be able to meet the challenges that I have just mm -hmm. described, uh, mm -hmm. meaning the, the loss of power of uh, qualifications, etc. At best, mm -hmm. they will uh, provide some indication about the skills that people have, uh, just like digital badges do, etc. But the assessment function is for me really critical. Most mm -hmm. micro-credentials fail to provide trustworthy assessment. Most micro-credentials uh, at this point in time, they just give a kind of indication that the student has done this or done that, not that it's providing a realistic and trustworthy assessment of the skills that people have. So for employers, it's not meeting their expectations. Uh, not yet, maybe. So I'm, I don't want to be completely negative. Uh, I think I have an ambivalent attitude. I'd still wait and see what's going to happen. And it's an interesting development. Um, but it's a development with many, many, many questions. And I don't see it as the ultimate savior of lifelong learning in the academic space. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dirk. And uh, it is really good to open with a provocative statement that go very much raising the issues at the heart around investment needed, around the mission needed, around the content needed, uh, and also uh, the sort of changing landscape and the relationship between universities and other providers. Um, we will be using the chat for our audience to share papers and resources, and we're trying very much to support one another, so please engage with us. But now I want to turn to Mark Brown, who I can't uh, think of a better person to take the floor after the frame that uh, Dirk uh, just sketched. Mark Brown, you're the Chair in Digital Learning and Director of the National Institute for Digital Learning at Dublin City University. So is the current attention to micro-credentials here to stay? Is it a solution or it's another passing educational fad uh, and we will soon be talking about something else? Over to you. Well, thank you very much. Um, really a perfect sort of question following on from uh, the end of the last talk. Um, for those who are not familiar with uh, my background, just to um, put it into context, because accents can be a difficult thing, uh, and to save anyone from embarrassing me in the chat box, um, I'm originally from New Zealand, not Australia, uh, and I've been in Ireland for about seven years. Um, the relevance of just that little bit of contextual or cultural information is that New Zealand was the first country in the world to formally recognise micro-credentials within the national qualification framework. Um, and we're seeing quite a lot of movement uh, elsewhere around the world. 
Um, I've been a member, along with quite a large group, of the European Commission's consultation group throughout this year on micro-credentials. So I'm going to come back to that um, in answering this question, I guess, as to whether we're really just dealing with yet another educational fad. Um, in answering that question, it typically raises more questions than answers. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves why micro-credentials, why at this time? Uh, we do have to try to figure out what, because we're not all talking the same thing when we use the word micro-credential. And then if we even get to the point of agreement about what we're talking about, how? So the sort of why, um, what, and how. But those three questions to make life even more complicated, I think operate at a kind of macro level, a global level, because this is a global movement. But they also operate, it's a bit of a cliche to use this sort of three-layered framework, but a meso and then a micro level as well. Perhaps the micro level is at the institutional level and the a meso level is at the country level because I'm going to share with you in the short time I've got a few interesting country initiatives over and above what I've um, talked about in relation to New Zealand. So um, First and foremost, the answer really depends on what we mean by micro-credentials. I'm going to come to the why shortly, but let's deal with the what first so we at least have some sense of what it is that we might be talking about. The truth is that there is no common definition of micro-credentials. Um, UNESCO, OECD, um, all sorts of organizations, including the European Commission, have tried to contribute reports. I put a link in the chat box there to a site that we maintain to just try to aggregate many of the different policy documents and reports. Um, but many have attempted definitions, and um, even within the European Commission expert group, when we began our work, uh, we began with a handful of definitions out of the literature, and there wasn't consensus. Um, so we begin with a sort of a, a starting point where different people have different views points. At one end, you could say, and it's not really a continuum, it's more complex than that, but the badging movement that I heard mentioned previously, um, many people do associate badging with micro-credentials. I personally try to make a very clear distinction. Um, badges, tend to come from a history. They have a history, certainly in English speaking countries. They come out of the gaming movement um, and other movements. And we often hear the expression um, warm body badges. In other words, badges that really um, don't have much relevance whatsoever. I get the handful for when I sometimes even just attend an event, they follow up with a badge, um, which typically goes into my delete box. Um, so we're not talking about that kind of um, credential or badge when I'm referring to the conversations at the European Commission level, we're actually trying to make a very clear distinction. Um, what I try to do when I have to explain this, even in my own institution, is keep things as simple as possible. So I often use sort of three dimensions of micro-credentials. The one we're placing most emphasis on currently are stackable, credit-bearing, uh, micro-credentials, if you think in your mind of a vertical axis and a horizontal axis, these are stacking up uh, on a horizontal axis and uh, they're not terminal, they build within um, one leading to another. In many respects, to keep things simple, we already have macro-credentials, degrees, master's qualifications, PhDs, what we're referring to in these credit-bearing stackable form of micro-credentials are just smaller parts of that, a micro-version. So that's kind of um, lifelong because it's the vertical side. Um, but then to add things to make it a little bit more complicated, um, not everything has to stack, not everything has to build on itself. So on the horizontal axis, perhaps we might see this as life-wide learning. I, probably like to see it more like a honeycomb mixing metaphors where people with their interests are pursuing courses, little units of learning, micro learning experiences, filling the honeycomb or the trellis, um, but not with anything that necessarily is very work ready, work driven. This is about personal interest driven. Where it gets even more complicated is I add a diagonal to this visual image I'm trying to paint for you 
is sometimes if you do lots of those horizontal things and you do go off to an event um, and just participate in the event, maybe if you put that into your portfolio and reflect on the event, and if you're coming from professions that have a, a background in keeping professional portfolios, then that could build up into something that you then seek assessment um, and it could lead to a micro-credential that indeed continues and be stackable. So I see that on the diagonal, if you like. So long and short, um, that's a very simplistic explanation to say micro-credentials can mean many things. They've got many different dimensions to them. Um, and what we're trying to do is put a common language at the European Commission level. Most importantly, what though we're really trying to do is um, embed and align micro-credentials as something that fits within the European qualification framework. So that we are really talking about something with a common language and alignment to national qualification frameworks. Um, so they are not just these, as I described, warm body badges or whatever else, certificates. Um, Mindful of time, just a couple of examples that are going on in this space, and I'm going to use Ireland as a small country um, as one example. I've been working with several colleagues on a national survey of micro-credentials, um, and that's in a major employees, uh, employers association, because one of the drivers for micro-credentials is not just lifelong learning, it is the new skills agenda. Um, and I say that sort of tongue in cheek because that has a very strong neoliberal um, work uh, vocational focus, which doesn't necessarily always resonate well with universities. And at the macro level, I'll even share in the chat box shortly a paper that talks about how um, this whole agenda is being driven by a neoliberal globalization of higher education, almost the supermarket model where the learner has the choice to pick and mix things across institutions. Hard to argue about the learner having more choice, unbundling the traditional degree that we choose, but there are deeper drivers underpinning it. Making it a little bit more um, straightforward though, here in Ireland, what we're doing is we've just recently secured 12 million euro for a national micro-credentialing initiative for universities to align uh, micro-credentials into the Irish qualification framework. Actually, we're quite unique in Europe. Our qualification framework already accommodates micro-credentials. Um, and my own university launched a micro-credential through FutureLearn, a credit-bearing stackable micro-credential in the area of FinTech um, back in February. Um, of course, one of the other drivers here for university, so these are mixed drivers, is one of new revenue sources because um, using a platform like FutureLearn allows us to look beyond the shores of Ireland um, for cohorts of learners, but also the flexibility that a micro-credential might offer as distinct from the bundled degree. And using a platform like FutureLearn means we are not locked into a two-semester fixed start date, fixed end date, maybe a summer school if you're more innovative or flexible. So we have a lot more responsiveness to the market in inverted commas. But in Ireland, part of what we're doing nationally is also entering into a co-design model with industry partners. And so this is another element of the response to an argument that universities aren't supporting work-ready learners in the way they may have once, or workers, dare I say it, and working closely with industry to find ways of giving smaller chunks of learning that meet their requirements, but also stack towards a qualification. I'm gonna end with, I could say lots, lots more. I'm gonna end with one point and come back to that bad um, question is this is a lot more complex than most people appreciate. Um, and within Europe, for example, um, one of the combined unions came out earlier in the year. There's a link to this with quite a strong statement of concern around micro-credentials. Um, and here in Ireland in our employers survey, we identified that many workers or many employees get salary increments based on their completion of credentials. It's built into the award, into the union negotiation. Micro-credentials have no meaning in those award agreements. And so hence the employees would not get a salary increment if they completed something. So 
that's how minute we have to get down into to bring people with us to give um, credibility to um, what I often refer to as the three C's currency, they have to have currency degrees sort of still have currency, they have to have coherence and they have to have credibility. Um, and at the moment, all three of those C's are quite weak in the micro-credentialing space. In some though, are they a fad? I don't think so. I think the drivers to redefine the credential ecology, as I call it, the current credential ecology was really created in the 19th century, maybe the 20th century. But we really do need things that are more fit for purpose and the pressures on universities to respond accordingly are very strong. Um, one, sorry, footnote, I should probably add, I'll put a link to this. I'm also involved with DCU in the European Consortium for Innovative Universities, the ECIU University, which is one of the European Alliance um, new funded programs where micro-credentials will be an output of 12 universities collaborating together. But I'm sure I've taken more than enough of my time. Thank you, Mark. Uh, you haven't. You are all perfect. You are the chair's dream. So uh, thank you very much. And uh, I wish we had the rest of the day to talk. Uh, and uh, I'm very tempted to actually suggest that we stay here until midnight. Uh, but uh, I'm sure others won't uh, agree. So um, I really like how we start uh, framing the core issues uh, that are uh, on the table uh, to actually really engage with micro-credentialing, uh, both in terms of the agenda, but also uh, the what needs to, to, to be there and what's different to attempt uh, and, and what has happened in the past. And uh, I think this is a really good transition um, to talk about how, when we actually talk at this sort of level of the policy and when we talk about currency coherence, credibility, how can we actually make connections with work that has already been done actually with the current development? Um, and it's a real pleasure to pass on the floor to a real expert on that, Aliva van der Brande. Uh, as a former senior policy administrator with the European Commission, uh, are there synergies between learning community approaches uh, and current development in micro-credentialing? Where are the synergies that, that you see? Thank you very much and I'm uh, and welcome uh, also this afternoon. Uh, it has already been very interesting. And I would like to add uh, the different uh, issues and uh, statements already given um, by Dirk and by Mark. But I want to focus, in fact, on the question, is, are macro-credentials, even in those uh, in the early stages of today, are they really going to change the educational model of today or the educational models used at higher education? And my answer to that will be a yes and a no, uh, because I think micro-credentials have to be closely embedded in the models, in the educational models used, otherwise uh, they make no sense. And I'm going to uh, also use four statements uh, to give input to the panel and to link it up to the education models that are also used in the Utopia uh, project. And I would really uh, like to say that micro-credentials on their own, um, they don't make sense. They are interesting, they trigger, but they have really to be part of uh, the global idea about what kind of education model uh, do we want uh, to promote through it and what are the triggers, we have heard those. And I really, uh, I agree that we should go further than words and mission statements and that we are not yet, but we should evolve into very concrete steps and actions. And we have to go there further uh, than terms as lifelong learning, uh, future skills. So let me go to the four uh, statements. But as an educational scientist, uh, I am going to focus on the importance of the delivery mode. So what is the next mode of learning and teaching at higher education and its importance? And 
I want to say now that I position myself not that it's going to replace existing delivery modes, but I see uh, this uh, debate about microcadelgias as complementing. I do believe still that graduates and degrees are important linked to uh, qualifications and will stay important, but it will not be the only importance or delivery, mo uh, delivery that higher uh, university has uh, to look into. So my first statement is that micro-credentials should be part of a bigger 360 approach of thinking about learning, where the learner, and I don't talk about uh, the jobs, where the learner is at the center. And when we really mean taking the individual learner at the center, I'm not saying it's the educational system that should be at the center. The individual learners are also driving digital batches, but the micro-credentials. I think an adult learner, even if it's a young adult learner or a mature learner, they are requesting nowadays another type of learning, teaching, and thus other pedagogies. And we have heard about it. They want to be more flexible, more personalized, much more uh, 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 individualized. Doesn't mean isolated. They want to be much more dynamic and there the micro-credentials come in, the, the modeler way of looking to it. But we have to listen to those learners. We have said this for so many years, but where are they? Where are they in, the, uh, in our policies? Where are they in the actions? And we should ask the learners themselves, what do you want? And if we listen carefully, they do want other things than we are offering. And so the conclusion is you have to really look into those uh, newer innovative pedagogies, but with personalization really at a center. When we, you know, that phrase of what, where, when uh, to, to learn, it's especially also how to learn. The, they want to do it in a different way. And I don't want to talk here about lifelong learners, but those mature learners that are coming in, that want to reskill, that want to upskill, that just want to go for another way. They want also another approach of how we offer education, how we offer or uh, deliver that learning and teaching. And that means that your curricula, the organization, of higher education must really become much more one of choice, that it must be more flexible, it must, must be more participatory. And you see that in the research world, open science, open research, open research practices, open exploration, it's quite exciting to see how that is functioning and being done. Why is the open learning delivery not really following. We have to, uh, to think about that and to connect or have synergies because the researchers often are also the teaching staff. They have, they have different roles to play, but that can interact. So micro-credentials, they do enhance, in my view, and they do support personal learning, but we have to look into what do we mean with that personalized and individual learning. Second statement is that we have to indeed look to the future skills and we have heard and there is demand, there are, there are things very much changing and uh, the, the, the world of work seems to ask uh, indeed for other types of, uh, of skills. And among those skills, they are saying we would like to have much more skills that have to do soft skills, transversal skills. I've been many years in the validation and recognition of informal and non-formal learning. Also, that is so much important. But I have to say, recognizing or even only validating these types of skills is really not easy to do. And today we are still in the trust mode and indeed assessment, but also identifying and describing those types of skills is not easy. ESCO is trying to do that, has tried to do it to build a bridge, but we are not yet there. Now, micro-credentials micro -credentials can play 
a, a, a role into that and they can mark a change in pushing higher education to take account of those competences and skills that they do uh, teach and students do learn those. It's not today that they have become important. They have been part of the journey of a student already for generations. But how can they be validated? How can be, they be taken with them? How can they in their, li in their life uh, be offered to reorient uh, the job or to do something else what they want? And I uh, give credit here to Ulf Ehlers. I enjoyed last days in re-reading his project on new skills and next skills and really uh, lovely uh, to see. Now, if you go for that, uh, you need to do uh, to look in that uh, learning delivery. And of course, third statement, higher education is becoming a network, an alliance of universities and digital is playing a role. But important is that it is networked and that the learning or delivery mode should focus on cooperation and collaboration. This is not easy to do. We are far from making this a reality and we use it a lot in our words, but being a networked university and an alliance will uh, really demand quite some uh, um, work done how to uh, improve interaction. But it's not enough to have a connected learning communities uh, with an individual focus, networked, looking into those future skills. And here I am now with my fourth statement. It is still a dream to become a lifelong learning university. It is there for many decennia already, indeed. But the last four or five years, it was not so much visible. It has become visible again into the communications uh, in Europe, but also across you. I think that the member states and the ministries and universities and the educational system do know that it is important. But with lifelong, I mean, you should at least uh, try to see that underrepresented students are there also, that you improve accessibility, but also guide and be guide those to be successful, and that you don't exclude what I call those adult learners. There are so many adult learners that are not low skilled, but are looking forward to uh, be to go and find and do things at the university level. Now, I come back and that's my last, um, uh, my last uh, sentence is, are indeed micro-credentials going to change that education model? Are they um, uh, changing recognition? And the answer is there, yes and no. But we have to go beyond the vision and the words. It's time for action. It's time to experiment it. And I think in the Utopia uh, project, there is that attempt to do it and to put it in, uh, in reality. And that reality should be, and it cannot be different. It's not a revolution. It's a step-by-step -step trying, experimenting, and then seeing what can be taken from it. So micro-credentials are for me a trigger to that debate. Thank you, Liebe. Amazing, uh, again, to sort of read, go deeper. Uh, and we have uh, a set of issues um, which go right at the heart of how much there has been a lot of talk. And uh, I think education has never attracted so much attention and, and we're talking so much about it now. Uh, how can we move from where we are uh, to the reality, uh, benefiting from the experience uh, of Bologna, of all the attempts to actually go uh, beyond harmonization, cross and transcend uh, boundaries and so on. And what can be the way? Is there a way to be a truly networked uh, university? Uh, what could be a solution? 
Uh, there is a very good discussion in the chat. Uh, I'm going to uh, turn to that after we have um, the opportunity to uh, also hear the Utopian colleagues uh, reacting to some of those big issues. Uh, but please keep using the chat uh, and, and we'll come back to that and, and uh, our panelists are um, interacting uh, and sharing resource. So turning to my Utopian colleagues and fellows, we heard quite a lot about what works and what doesn't work uh, and the, um, uh, the, the what is still the dream, but also uh, the long way to go um, is uh, our Utopian learning model and development the solution? Have we actually found the pathway to, uh, to um, a truly networked uh, education? Have we found a way to go beyond borders? Um, and I would like to start uh, with Jan Dankert, uh, your Vice Rector of Educational and Student Affairs uh, at uh, VUB, Rye University in Brussels, uh, and uh, also centrally, um, responsible for our education package uh, um, alongside Mete, who is going to take the floor in a minute. What is innovative about our Utopia learning model? What is it that we're doing that uh, could be part of the solution? Well, uh, thank you, Joe, and also thank you to, to the previous panelists for their provocative uh, statements, which I'm sure, <laughs> sure we will not be able to give all the answers, but they surely uh, stimulate our thinking. I'm also very glad to, to be in charge of this uh, Utopia educational model, and I think as a vice director, it's one of the most exciting uh, projects which, uh, 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 which I have under my responsibility. And as Liv indeed said, the Utopia ed educational model we chose for a step-by-step -step, uh, approach. And then in order to illustrate that, I'll first explain what the Utopia educational model is not. It's not about harmonization. It's not about joint degrees. And it's not about long-term mobility of one semester of, uh, or more of students. By which I mean that we don't exclude these as side effects or as when they are pedagogically motivated, they, they are certainly a possibility, but they are not our primary goal, they are not our aim. So the question is then, what do we do uh, instead? Well, our basic building blocks, our uh, parting uh, uh, point is our existing credit bearing parts of our of curriculum in one of our universities of the Alliance, which we called learning, which we call learning units, uh, which also, and that's sort of important, uh, are in that respect subject to the quality assurance mechanisms that are in place in, in our institutions by whatever uh, accreditation organisms and other they are, uh, they are. So we start from existing learning units, but not from whatever learning unit. They, they have to satisf satisfy uh, when we select them, four criteria. Three criteria linked uh, related to openness, and these are open across disciplines. So uh, uh, they should be uh, open to accommodate, accommodate learners or other uh, teaching staff from other uh, uh, universities in the Alliance across disciplines. They should be open to a diversity of students. So in that way, they also could accommodate more adult uh, uh, students, uh, but diversity in the different meanings of the word, and they should be also be open to extra academic stakeholders, and they might come from business world, economic, from cultural, political, social, whatever uh, background. These are the three criteria of openness, and the fourth one is that they should be student-centered and active uh, learning. And what we do then, uh, we, we select these learning units, and we've just had this week our second round of selection in which we selected 12 more learning units. We already had six in the uh, first round. And then we create communities around them, and th this is what we call the collect, uh, connected learning uh, communities across our six uh, institutions. And that can be in different curricula. For, and I'll illustrate that with example. For example, uh, a learning unit in cognitive science in one of our university also uh, is, is in the same community with other colleagues teaching in departments like psychology, AI, and philosophy. So they are in the same uh, learning community. Also, they can be across the different levels, bachelor, master, uh, PhD. 
Also there, in order to give, uh, illustrate with an, an example, a learning unit which is in a bachelor program, in this case of data science in, in University A, can be in the master program uh, of another university in another curriculum or, or in the same, that depends. And this also solves problems that uh, some of our partners have four-year bachelor programs, some have three-year bachelor programs, some have one-year master, one, some have two years master, so that also solves uh, that problem. So I think our, we call it our Coleco model, so the uh, connected learning communities is in that sense maybe more innovative in what it is not than in rather uh, uh, what it is. So there's not necessarily a, a harmonization, maybe on the long run harmonization will be a side effect in that we, we, we start aligning things among us, but that's not necessary. And also long-term mobility of students for one semester or more from place A to B is not necessary. Short-term mobility would be an advantage, of course, in the uh, uh, in the in the current situation of COVID, we were very lucky that we didn't need that mobility, and so that we hardly had any delay in uh, the implementation of these uh, learning communities. What can they be instead of, uh, of the criteria, the four which I mentioned? Co-creation is definitely. Uh, uh, a plus co-creation of learning material, and there we, we could uh, uh, we could touch upon what, what Leva also uh, uh, said about uh, uh, go towards open uh, open learning, co-create learning material, which is then also opened uh, to the rest of the of, of the world. And this co-creation can be uh, in 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 different levels. I come back to that. The teaching should be hybrid and blended because otherwise certainly in, in, in the pandemic situation but also the, if not we, we, we uh, it should be uh, hybrid and blended it was luckily uh, quite covid uh, proof and then as i said the, the there are different levels of connectedness in these uh, communities and that depends on the community we leave them their freedom the, the connectedness can be among the students, uh, of course, uh, of, of different institutions which work together on projects. Or uh, uh, they, it can also be on the level of the teaching staff, co-creating common learning material, for example. It can also be between uh, because we involve uh, extra academic stakeholders. Uh, so it can also be among the stakeholders, but it can also be connecting the student of University A with the stakeholder of University B. For, uh, for example, so also this, uh, this connectedness can be across the different levels, student, teaching staff and stakeholders. I believe our, uh, our approach in that way is compatible uh, with micro-credentials. Do we need micro-credentials? I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not sure, but it's, I believe it's compatible. Now, I think there's a link with open science and open learning, and maybe I, I have a, uh, I was, when I heard the three previous speakers, I had another uh, provocative question. So lifelong learning, it's very much positions on the European level, but if we are really thinking, I have two comments. If we are, the first one is, if we are really thinking about these adult learners, so uh, uh, these learners which probably have in some way a family life or a professional life and they have to combine their learning with uh, uh, with uh, with this uh, well with the stage of the life which they are in then should the lifelong learning be on a european level and should it be organized on, on the level of for example a european university alliance because these people are due to the way of our life, maybe more profoundly locally rooted. And it's maybe for them much more important that the interaction whenever it takes place is much more local and, and close to them than, uh, uh, than on a European level. So should it be on a European level? And should, would the local level not be more effective? And I recall that in fact, when universities started with blended learning, in fact, it was driven by these demands from uh, from working students who had really no time to uh, to come to all the lectures, uh, to lectures and, and demanded for more uh, digital content to be uh, uh, to be available. And the second comment which I made is with, with so which is also working students, but not the, the adult ones, now the young ones. And we, we really, uh, we, very recently we had a, a survey in our university and maybe in the other universities, it's also the case, but we, we were a bit surprised that 
approx approximately 40% of our 18 year olds uh, entering university indicated that they were working or going to work while they were studying. That's, uh, and the amount of, and uh, the average amount of hours per work, uh, of work per week that they indicated was 11 hours per week, which is, uh, was for me at least quite uh, surprising. And in this category of working students, we see an overrepresentation of students with migration backgrounds, with, which uh, with other linguistic backgrounds, so we, we do not speak the language, the instruction language, or we do not have the instruction language as a first language uh, at their home. Often they are multilingual, and there's also a representation with students with, uh, with uh, scholarships. So we, we deal with working students, not only in the adult, uh, uh, with the adult uh, work, uh, students, but also in our, in our freshmen, in the students uh, uh, entering university. These are two comments which I would like to make at the end. Uh, Floris, again yours, Joe. Thank you, Jan. Thank you. And thank you for uh, describing the work we're doing. Uh, there are also some links uh, on the chat and uh, um, we, we are trying to uh, also have more information about how the translation of the education model. So uh, if colleagues are interested, uh, please keep an eye as the pages are still at a very uh, young age, but they're growing. Um, thank you, Jan. And uh, if I can turn to Mete, who actually follows very organically from the issues that Jan raised uh, so Mette, you're Deputy Vice Chancellor at the University of Gothenburg and co-lead the uh, education package. How can we implement? What are the challenges in terms of barriers that you anticipate uh, in implementing uh, and being able to move from this frame that our external to Utopia colleagues have actually helped us frame? Uh, the work that we're doing internally, where do you actually see barriers uh, in being able to turn this to reality um, and progress the agenda? Thank you so much, Joe, and thanks to the rest of you. Uh, my reflections on these challenges in terms of barriers are connected to the question on how far we aim to integrate the operation within our universities. And as you heard from John, the, the Utopia model we are implementing right now encloses uh, building learning communities, departing from selection of learning units as a way to integrate students, uh, teachers and stakeholders. So for the time being, uh, the establishment of learning communities is the way Utopia opens up for existing operations for the alliance partners to be involved in and as well a part of. But if uh, or when taking this step further uh, by importing learning units into the curriculum of each partner university, which means uh, formalizing the integration, however, it poses some challenges, maybe not directly connected to this discussion on micro credentials. And I will briefly mention three of those as being highlighted as preliminary results. I, uh, preliminary, I would say in the work conducted by Anna Maria Fjellman, assigned to investigate this task within our project. And those barriers uh, revolve uh, around three areas, administration, uh, academic calendar, and program structure and access. And the first one, uh, administrative barriers uh, include aspects as, for example, agreements, transfer of credits, conduction of accreditation, degrees, and assessment regulations. And such tasks are likely dependent on national or local legislations and varies across, varies accordingly among our, our partners. And if we aim to formally integrate learning units into the curriculum, uh, prerequisites as those mentioned have to, of course, be taken into account. So thus, the administrative differences between our, for example, accreditation system, degree regulations, etc have to be harmonized if learning units are to be part of the curriculum. And I think that's a challenge that would probably take severe time and effort in account to overcome. Uh, and it has likely to be worked on both on a local uh, and a governmental level. The second challenge in terms of barriers uh, revolves around differences in academic calendars between our universities. And they 
academic, academic year is structured different for each of our partner universities in terms of the placement of each semester during the year, but also uh, more maybe privately connected ones as holidays and breaks, uh, how they are structured within the, the semesters. And furthermore, the academic year can also be divided into either two or three semesters. So in the short, it affects possibilities for brief exchanges during course activities, for sure, uh, within the learning unit, for example. And in the long run, it can also have implications for more full-fledged student participation possibilities. So thus, the different academic calendars and timetables also set some prerequisites for planning procedures and dissemination of course activities and staff cooperation. And accordingly, such differences between our universities have them to be faced and tackled somehow if further integration is uh, to be enabled. And the last um, group of barriers, degree program structure, fields of study and access structures at our, at our universities have also have impact on student, student participation possibilities and can therefore then be barriers as well. And just to remind uh, ourselves, it has already been done, but again, uh, an important aim and vision of the Utopia universities is to further the core uh, values of the European Union, namely inclusion and openness and equality. Uh, our strive is then towards reaching uh, this aim and vision could be hampered uh, by, for example, regulations surrounding professional degrees. And classic examples here are education towards legal, teaching, and medical professions. I name a few of them. And those are commonly regulated on a national basis, and students need specific courses also to be examined uh, within these for, for these degrees. And such prerequisites regulations connected to the curriculum in the South uh, then could of course limit student possibilities to participate in other universities' uh, portfolios or educations. Another limiting aspect within this third group of barriers, however not specifically actually connected to our cooperation, uh, is students' choices of field of study. And we know that how students choose are commonly compounded by background characters as gender and ethnicity, parental background, uh, education background, and social class. And such inherent cultural structures are somehow invisible, uh, I would say, and often quite hard to get a hold on, even within one single university's culture setting. And if we think then mixing different culture settings, which is the case when cooperating, as we are in Utopia, it could then thus be even harder to tackle those uh, while necessary actions are both culturally and university dependent. And another dimensional example within this, uh, in line with the former one, is national differences when it comes to access or possibilities to access to higher education. And here we see variation in student application procedures, uh, enrollment structures, mobility structure patterns. They can also, of course, then um, in hamper inclusion, both to the blurriness, uh, I guess, uh, such variations can shape for the students, but there can also be limitations stemming from, for example, a different application procedure compared to what one is used to. So thus aspects of access can therefore be a barrier when integrating learning units as part of the curriculum. So to somehow wrap up what I've said, I put focus on three groups of challenges that we have seen in this uh, investigation by Anna Maria uh, and when aiming to then if you want to formally then integrate learning units into the curriculum uh, that is so if we want to take a further step beyond establishing establishing learning communities as we do now uh, then we have to, to face these and if we as an alliance is determined to extend our collaboration by formally integrate learning units which we haven't said yet but that could be a long-term aim then into the curriculum measures then has to be, curriculum measures then has to be taken. And some of the barriers, I guess, could probably be worked on or improved by efforts by ourselves. For example, those connected to more cultural settings and calendar planning, et cetera. And others, though they have more of the more, so they have more of an administrative character. They are more, I would say, I guess, dependent on legislative actions, we then need actions and also willingness 
to be addressed on both national as well as European Union levels. Yeah, that's it. Thank you, thank you, Mete. Thank you, and uh, I think it's uh, it, it is very much a sort of truism. I think that goes back to um, um, Mark. I think mentioned that the micro, meso, macro, but it is so important that the minute one leaves the world of paper and nice words and turns to the actual reality, then things get so much more complex. And uh, mm -hmm. I really think that uh, we. One hour and a half was really not enough. Um, um, uh, uh, some of you have already sent messages saying we need more time. That's really excellent. And we'll, we'll, thank you. That's wonderful. We'll take that into sort of account how we could continue this discussion. But I think it is really fundamental that uh, we're talking about very different models there. Uh, so um, we're running slightly, uh, although we're all very much on time, uh, we somehow uh, miss minute here and there. So uh, I've asked my uh, last two colleagues and very close partners to crime to, um, to forgive my chairing for cutting a little bit from their time uh, so that we can take some of the questions and please use the chat. Uh, and thank you very much to our panelists who are taking the questions from our participants and are responding as we go along. So please make the best use of the time we have uh, uh, today and we'll continue the conversation. So uh, we've been hearing a lot about how uh, there are barriers, but also there is a lot that we can learn from current work and some current projects. Uh, Linda Morio, you are coordinating a strategic project on community-engaged community research and learning for VUB uh, called uh, Universi University. Um, can you uh, tell us how you embed community partnerships and transformative educational partnerships in VUB curricula uh, and how that could be and is in line with the Utopia model? Thank you. Yes, of course. Thank you, Joe. Uh, let me start by saying that it's a true honor to be part of the Utopian adventure. It's a great honor uh, as well to be part of this panel. So thank you, and I'm of course very happy to share my experiences with University, a project that, as you pointed out, aims at embedding urban partnership within VB's curriculum in order to help realize uh, VB's ambition to connect and interact more closely with our immediate surroundings, our hometown Brussels, while at the same time uh, creating opportunities for rethinking reinventing our educational offer. Now, in order to explore these opportunities as broadly as possible, we did install a learning community of university staff, um, students, community partners, people with a wide variety of uh, disciplinary backgrounds, professional and life experiences, but with a shared uh, interest in uh, what we started to call uh, community engaged research and learning. Uh, we organized a series of uh, learning circles where we collaboratively explored recent um, research findings relevant to the context of engaged pedagogies and engaged uh, research uh, sessions where we uh, shared useful tools and um, networks and experiences and uh, where we supported one another uh, in re-imagining -im and remodeling our teaching and uh, research, research practices by formulating uh, targeted redesign ambitions and work towards um, targeted redesign interventions. Now we use this uh, concept of community engaged research and learning as an umbrella uh, concept for teaching, learning and research initiatives that are embedded in real life context, uh, allowing participants to put theory into practice, apply disciplinary uh, expertise and skills to authentic uh, cases, and by doing so, allow them to come to a better understanding of the applied course content, uh, allow them to broaden uh, understandings of both strengths and limits of their own disciplinary fields and uh, expertise, make them more aware of their own levels of understanding, help them reveal um, potentially limiting misconceptions 
and through interaction, active uh, dialogue with others, help them revisit their interpretation schemes and guiding principles, help them uh, develop new ways of looking at things, understanding and handling with things, and thereby generating what you called, Joe, a transformative learning experience. Now, besides the academic and uh, professional relevance, uh, allowing participants to develop both uh, discipline-specific as well as transversal skills as they, as they have been uh, brought forward, um, we do think of engaged practices as a means to raise awareness about the so-called grand societal challenges, stimulating participants to reflect upon both um, individual as well as collective responsibilities towards those uh, challenges, uh, while at the same time offering a concrete opportunity uh, to build capacity for taking responsible action uh, and help tackling or addressing those issues. Now, the activities of the learning community allowed us to develop uh, a shared language about community engagement at VUB, allowed uh, participants to come to a more broad uh, appreciation of the potentialities of engaged practices for designing powerful learning environments and offering impactful learning opportunities, both, I would argue, from a lifelong learning perspective, as well as from a broad, humanistic and more holistic perspective on teaching and learning. Now, in order to feed in some arguments that might be relevant within the scope of this discussion, uh, I would like to bring forward two elements uh, that were central to the university project and, at least in my experience, uh, were key in making it successful. The first one um, is the fact that we actively strive for bringing in a wide variety of expertise uh, to the learning communities. We did involve people working in the field of criminology, engineering, journalism, uh, geriatrics, adult education, uh, much more. People working with private partners, big companies and industries, as well as people working with small sized NGOs, local citizens groups, young, old, academic staff, um, people working in administration, etc. cetera. Um, and the diversity, this diversity of perspectives and expertise was really brought forward as one of the main assets uh, by the participants in our uh, learning uh, trajectory. For it had allowed them to shape diversity-rich and diversity-sensitive approaches by making them more mindful about the diverse needs as well as assets that various stakeholders can do bring uh, to um, the learning environment and help them uh, develop apt strategies for supporting participants in multi-stakeholders teaching and research activities to work towards shared ownership and build capacity to actively co-design and co-assess collective learning processes. Now, a second element that I would like to stress is the fact that we actively targeted a change, um, future-oriented approach. Uh, we were challenging one another to think beyond established routines, norms, and relationships, uh, tried to be each other's uh, best critical friends forever by creating a safe space uh, for engaging in authentic uh, dialogue, stimulating one another to actively seek for hidden agendas, reveal unfair, disrespectful or unsustainable practices and work, uh, work towards uh, genuinely inclusive learning environments being mindful not to create um, curricular chaos or be it consciously or unconsciously install novel obstacles or hurdles preventing access um, to or active participation in the proposed learning activities and program. 
And I think that both these elements being diversity sensitive and bringing in a critical dimension will be crucial for making our utopian adventure successful in shaping a new horizon for the European educational landscape. And I do believe that the creative connections that are central to the development of our educational model will allow us to do so as they actively feed in diverse voices, practices, forms of expertise and aspiration, and will guide us in walking the talk of creating an open, inclusive, student-centered, responsive and highly relevant pedagogic offering. So I'm really excited to take my experiences in working with connected learning communities to a next level. And I'm really proud to be part of this utopian endeavor. Thank you, Linda. Thank you. That's 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 really good. And it's so important to see uh, the, you mentioned two very important points. They need to develop a common language because uh, we often talk in parallel and we don't have time to open this, which is another Pandora box. But even what a course and a module means uh, is it would be a subject of a sort of project itself but also the amount and the volume of time and commitment it takes uh, to bring colleagues on board. And if we again translate what it means to have a critical friend when we all know how our diaries are and uh, the other pressures of life and, and sort of uh, taking academic colleagues out of all the various other things to do this strategic conversations, thinking out of the box is actually gets us very much back to the question of capacity uh, and I would like to close this absolutely fascinating uh, input that we had from all of you with uh, uh, Rosette Sayers uh, to uh, exactly on that point. Um, uh, my uh, good colleague and very close partner in, the, in this journey. So Rosette, uh, Senior Advisor of the Vice Director of Education and Student Affairs at VUB. Uh, and coordinator for uh, our education package. Uh, the question for you uh, in five minutes, and because you're uh, the closest, I'm going to actually fidget even more <laughs> so that we have five minutes for questions. Uh, what capacity does a university need to build uh, in order to engage uh, and sort of start seeing some of those dreams turning into reality? How can universities engage in lifelong learning and micro-credentialing pragmatically and realistically from your experience? Five minutes, simple question. <laughs> You're muted. <laughs> You're still muted, Rosette, can't hear you. Oh, now we can't see you either. Voila, yeah. Ah, hang on. I should unmute and... Um... Yes. Is this okay? Yes. yes yeah. Yes, okay. Yes, sorry. Yes, that was a false start. But uh, thank you, Joe, for giving me the privilege of answering the last question. It's not a simple one, but well, the, the advantage of that is that I'm very near to the end of the panel and that we uh, probably will end with more questions than answers so that we can open up the gate then to the audience and, and, uh, and have them uh, uh, ask them to help us out and, and give us, uh, I think, uh, some good practices that they are aware of. Uh, it is clear, I think, from all the messages that were translated here that our universities are expected uh, to increase their efforts for lifelong learning and that micro-credentials might be uh, an important vehicle for this. Um, at, at, at the same time, um, uh, we heard, uh, I'm not going to repeat that, we heard a, a, a lot of interesting references to the type of barriers that we are confronting to uh, put uh, all this in, in, in practice and to implement uh, and to become a, a provider in, in this, I shall call it market uh, of, of, of lifelong learning. And um, yeah, really successfully meet the needs and the expectations of, 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 a, of a mature public and of another type of um, participants than the 18 year old ones that uh, come right uh, from the secondary school and, and go into higher education. And, and the barriers can take many forms. We heard about 
uh, yeah, the uh, the state of mind of our universities and and our priorities at institutional level for lifelong learning. It can, of course, be linked to identifying and allocating resources for this uh, for this new uh, uh, new task that we put upon ourselves. And last but not least, I think we have to make sure that uh, we don't create even more overload for staff and infrastructure that is already under high pressure uh, as the last decennia we have been confronting and challenged by an increasing number of students and an increasing number of activities also in uh, research and, uh, and innovation. In other words, the economist is then speaking, uh, which is my background, we will have to find uh, the, the famous word, a business model for enabling us to move away from uh, the theoretical potential for, for this type of approach towards actual uh, implementation. And um, uh, I didn't know that uh, Dirk was going to say that we were, we didn't have changed that much uh, in the last 40 years. Uh, but coincidence is that, uh, well, I'm working for about 40 years in, in academia and that my first um, days at the university or my first years of the university, and now nostalgia is is, uh, is 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 coming to look around the corner uh, that they were um, devoted for a major part to um, uh, creating an offer for and Jan also referred to it already to what we called dual learners at the time that means people combining work and studying. And uh, it is with some nostalgia that I think of this, but, but I, uh, it also is reassuring that in fact, uh, uh, in that period, we started to conceive the concepts that we again need today for coping with the increasing needs uh, that uh, come to us uh, um, at, at, uh, for in this field. Um, and uh, I, I remember that we um, had to teach a course in economics for, for the, these working, so-called working students. And we had a lot of those in, Bru in the Brussels region, as Brussels is, of course, the location for a lot of public administrations. And Sound, Rosette. Sound. So we can't hear you. Is this better? Yes. Yeah, right. sorry. It's the Zoom application that is really a, a problem with on, on my PC. So at that time, uh, in, and I'm talking about the 70s now, uh, most public servants didn't have a, a, an academic degree. And at that time, Derek, we still needed a degree to get promoted and to improve our career development. So they were very interested in obtaining an academic degree. And we, uh, yeah, we organized uh, the courses for them after hours, after working hours. So they came to the campus uh, and they took, uh, uh, they, they took the courses uh, that, that we planned for them. And um, yeah, um, what, what did I do in the beginning? As uh, inexperienced as I was, I, I just tried to teach the course that I uh, offered to the regular students at a much higher speed in order to cover the same uh, range of topics as, as I did for the regular students. Of course, this proved not to be a really fantastic method for uh, motivating people to, uh, um, to, to listen and, and to learn uh, uh, late uh, at the end of the day after working for several hours and, and, and uh, in order to keep them uh, motivated and literally awake, I had to find another, uh, another solution. And what I did then is that I reduced the numbers of uh, ex cathedra teaching and I just uh, divided my course in a number of uh, modules and I asked the, the students, the participants in the, in the dual learning to prepare for, uh, uh, for the course before they came to the classroom. And then in the classroom, I didn't teach anymore, but I confronted them with a number of articles uh, in the press uh, telling about uh, recent uh, uh, economic developments. And I asked the participants, the students, 
to take my role and to connect these articles and the events in economic uh, actuality to, in fact, the concepts that, that they have been reading about in, uh, in the course material. And that proved to be a rather effective way of, of uh, getting them interested and getting them um, uh, yeah, motivated uh, for the course. Um, so on my own, I think uh, I, I try to find a sort of avant la lettre uh, application of, of active learning and of uh, uh, creating interest and, and uh, listening to the needs of, of professional, so-called professional students. Um, Moreover, and I think this was also a very important part of the experience, and, and we now feel in the learning communities that this is, in fact, also a very important uh, value added of, uh, uh, of our approach, is that the students um, created a connectedness among them. So that means that they started to operate as a team of students uh, working together with the teacher but also supporting each other mutually in advancing in the learning process. And, and that is, I think, also a very important characteristic of the learning communities that the connectedness among students and among teachers and students and, and among uh, stakeholders is a very important one to, to, uh, to arrive at. So this little experiment, I think, included most of the ingredients that are characteristic for our utopia building blocks today, and that make us perhaps a potential provider if we want to be one uh, for uh, as a future, uh, let's say, uh, uh, player in, in the market of lifelong learning and micro credentials. Hmm? In fact, what do we need and what do we use today? A selection of teachers ready to uh, experiment with active learning, and educational, innovative educational formats at a European scale. That's what we have. That's what the selection rounds, in fact, uh, uh, result into. Uh, we uh, need to reach out towards the professional background and the employers of the participants in lifelong learning. And that's also what we do in, in, uh, uh, in, in Utopia. We need not to pretend to create a complete new range of degrees or courses, but we need to invite, I think, the participants to profit from the strengths that we have in our present curricula in our universities. So we do not do everything for everybody, but I think we have to profit from the strengths that we already have and uh, open these up to the participants in, in the learning communities. And of course, we make use of blended formats and we combine preparatory work that can be organized online with uh, intense face-to-face -face meetings in order to create a community connectedness, a feeling of belonging to a project that is so very important for maintaining uh, the effort for learning in a combined, uh, in a combined situation of learning, working, and uh, as already mentioned, family life, and, and create a, or uh, maintain a certain harmony uh, in doing so. Uh, so I think my anecdote shows also uh, the need for cooperating with other uh, educational sectors and providers um, uh, outside academia, as we will not be able to fill in and to create a, a monopoly in this market. We are not uh, uh, having today and also not, I think, in the, in the medium run, the capacity for dealing with all the needs uh, at this level. So that's uh, why I hope that in future discussions already today, we will learn from good practices in other places uh, and uh, in other organizations and to uh, in fact arrive at uh, creating a, a complementary offer uh, and um, yeah, creating bridges uh, uh, amongst all the providers that will be uh, active in this field in, in, in the coming years. 
Thank you, Rosette. Uh, thank you. I think that's uh, that's a, a sort of a very good way to round up both in terms of uh, of what we can do, but also how sometimes I find it quite scary when we go back and we hear about things that someone tried in the 70s or in the 60s and the 50s and uh, and, and sort of uh, one thing, are we perpetually reinventing the wheel and there is not enough braveness and boldness and courage to say, okay, if we are really going to change a model, we also need to think of some upfront investment because I think what is a sort of white elephant in the room going around is resource for all these wonderful things to move from experimentation to implementation, right? Because this is really fundamental when we actually move from turning good practice reality. Now, uh, I think this is a fascinating conversation and uh, I'm very proud of my chairing skills and I have a reputation which I'm risking losing today, uh, but uh, I'm going to put it down to the fantastic input that our panelists gave, uh, which is what made us run uh, behind time. Uh, I know some of you need to go uh, and, uh, and, and uh, some of you uh, already contacted me to ask me to have a follow on and a longer event. I think this is an excellent mm -hmm. idea and I'm going to follow up with the panelists and see whether uh, we could have a sort of workshop uh, with a sort of longer time to debate and, and it's wonderful to see already uh, some of our uh, external panelists noting, which means that uh, we could put pressure to make time in the very busy diaries. Um, uh, there are some questions. I want to uh, formally uh, make the speech act of the day and, and acknowledge that colleagues will need to go. So close the formal part of the panel. There has been amazing conversation on the chat. Thank you for engaging and thank you to our external panelists for staying on and for engaging with the questions. Uh, so I would like to thank uh, both my Utopian colleagues and the external colleagues. We're going to stay online for those of you who want to stay online uh, to kind of, uh, uh, if there is anything uh, which is quick or any quick follow on uh, until we have to go, but uh, I'm going to invite everybody to give a round of applause to our speakers. And then whoever needs to go can go and whoever can stay for any quick remarks uh, can also stay for another uh, five, 10 minutes. So thank you all uh, for really the exciting uh, input and for really framing and putting on the table both the aspiration and the vision, but also uh, the challenges and the way we have to go to turn the dream to reality. Uh, there is a lot of good practice on the table. There's a lot of expertise. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think we do have a unique opportunity with the framework, with the public policy framework. Uh, I very much believe in the European university initiatives and I really hope that collectively we can push the sector forward. So thank you very much all. Uh, I'm going to do it the traditional way. I already saw people uh, using Zoom for that. Um, thank you. And thank you for uh, everybody being very generous with your time. Mm -hmm. So if you need to go, thank you very much. Uh, if you can stay, uh, you're very welcome to stay, uh, but that will be the formal end of, of the panel. Thank you.